may know this weekend, we're celebrating storytelling. Storytelling is a great way that Native cultures pass on their tradition, their history, their lessons, their morals to the young ones so that they can pass it on to their children and grandchildren. And we've had storytelling in many different ways this weekend. Some of you may have picked up a comic book at the information table. That's how the Chickasaw Nation is reaching out to youth with their stories. We had yesterday a totem pole from the Simshian people dedicated and unveiled. You may have seen that in the very large Potomac atrium. That tells the story of a young chief and an eagle. And we also had a dance group here yesterday from uh, the Simshian people. And today we had dance group from the St. LeBray Indian School in Montana. So there's lots of ways that you can see that Native peoples tell their story. So today we have for you an elder from the Quileute tribe, Mr. Chris Morganroth. And Chris has been telling stories for a long time and passing on his culture in many different ways through carving and through being kind of a, a culture bearer for his people to uh, visitors to the reservation, to government agencies, to educators, and to children and families. So you will get some insight into a couple things today. Who are the Quileute people? Where do they live? What do they do? What's their culture like? Some of their traditional stories. And then also, any of you that are kind of up on pop culture may know that the Quileutes are featured in a certain way in some of the Twilight books and movies. So Chris will be able to address who are the Quileutes in reality versus who are the Quileutes in Hollywood. So there will be an opportunity to hear about some of that as well. If you've not seen, I would recommend that you please check out on the second floor, there's a new exhibit about the Quileute people and wolves versus werewolves related to uh, that movie series and that book series. It kind of gives you a deeper and broader picture, picture rather, of who the Quileute people are so you don't just get movie stereotypes about werewolves and vampires. There's much more to the culture than that, and like I said, you'll get to see what's real and what's not real. Also, if you've not had a chance to see, I would recommend that you get to see the horses exhibit on the third floor, Song for a Horse Nation, celebrates those cultures that have had horses as a long part of their culture. Just a couple theater etiquette rules that we ask you to please be respectful of. We ask that if you have a cell phone, you please turn it off so that it does not ring during the storytelling. There is no videography permitted. There is no audio recording permitted. You are able to take a photo if you do it judiciously and rarely and do not interrupt your neighbor from hearing the storytelling by lots of clicking. So with all that said, I really want to thank you for being here and I ask you to please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mr. Chris Morganroth of the Quileute Culture. In my language, that means good morning. At home, I told my people a long time ago, because a lot of them were forgetting our language. And I say that any time, any day, any day of the week, midnight, morning, afternoon, and they all caught on. So they knew at least two words in Quileute, Hachche, good morning. And after I got to teaching the, the language in some of the classes, it, uh, it grew a little bit more, but it, it was the younger people who were more receptive to the language uh, teaching, and uh, some of the uh, kids that were in high school were less receptive. And, uh, but I, I developed a way to teach the language to them where they were jumping up and down. And I'll, I'll, like, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. So I, uh, when I retired, nobody else was teaching that language. And so uh, they don't really have a language teacher there anymore. They, they, they're using the books and the dictionaries and, and the CDs and the DVDs and things like that. Because we have all of, the, all of those uh, things to work with the school. And, and the teachers are, uh, are uh, willing to to utilize those instruments and uh, they would like to have me come back and I asked them, I said, oh, okay, could you make one day a week available for me to uh, teach uh, the Quileute language because we don't want to lose our language. I, I always said that uh, when anybody loses their language, they lose their identity and we don't want to do that. We, at our school, we teach every aspect of our culture. We, we do the basket weaving, the drumming, singing, dancing, uh, the traditional foods, the medicines, uh, 
the uh, uh, everything we, we have to learn from uh, from everybody that still knows how to uh, teach the uh, various things that they know and we have a lot of basket weavers and uh, I help them go out to get their material to bring back home to help them uh, maintain their their uh, needs for the basket weaving and things like that so we, we still try to keep our culture alive uh, and to uh, uh, teach it to others as well. And uh, I grew up in a, in a home where my mother left home actually when I was eight months old. And I regretted that. And I, I still regret that today, but she's gone, gone to be with the Lord. But uh, um, my grandmother raised me from the time I was eight months old until she passed on when I was about 12. And she didn't speak English. She spoke, she spoke only the Quileute language. So I, I learned the Quileute language, and she taught me stories. And she, she uh, told different stories every week almost. And I was very uh, uh, fortunate to have this kind of an environment in the home. And uh, the thing about having stories is that you don't have books, you don't have pencils, you don't have TV, you don't have radio, or anything like that. So. Uh, uh, the, the teaching way for, for my people was by way of story. And uh, different uh, stories have different meanings, and, and uh, some of them are, are ways of uh, relating to the young people, how to, how to get along in the world, and, and how to recognize evil things and, and stay away from those things that are evil, and to uh, uh, understand why the things are the way they are today as they were compared with uh, at the beginnings of time. In the beginnings of time, my people always said that they, they had the ability to turn into animals and back, and back into people again at will. Uh, I don't know, you know, my, my, that's just the way my teacher or my uh, ancestors were teaching, my, my grandmother especially and my, and my father and, and other, other members of my family extended family, they, they wanted to teach me as much as they could, and I wanted to learn as much as I could, and uh, so I mean, there was a period of time when, when I didn't have any of those things, and uh, when after my grandmother passed away, then uh, I lived more with my father because he was traveling around a lot. He, he worked for uh, places like Boeing, he worked for Todd Shipyard during the war, he was also a uh, 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 he watched for the, uh, the ships and the airplanes from a lookout up in the mountains because he was a, a great mountain climber. And when the Navy found out about him and his knowledge of the mountains and, the, and his knowledge about all the different things that go on on the coastline, they hired him to, be, to head the program of identifying any uh, aircraft, whether it be friendly or, or enemy, or ship along the coastline. And in his lookout, he had pictures of all the ships and all the aircraft from the world in three-dimensional uh, brown cardboard all around the, all the walls. And he could identify any of these during the war. And uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate to go up into his lookout, and he showed me all of the things that he did. He worked for the Navy for something like five years. But uh, when he worked for, the, worked for Todd Shipyard, he helped build one of the big ships that were sunk by uh, uh, the enemy during the war on the Pacific Ocean. And uh, so he, he, he learned a lot of different things from, from, the, from the world as, as well as having a great knowledge of uh, my culture and my people. And so, I, as I said, I was very fortunate to be there. And uh, when, my, when my grandmother took the uh, task of raising both my my uh, two older sisters and myself. And uh, when she told stories, she, was, she used to always begin the stories by uh, saying, Tatsaikila, which means a long time ago. And the longer she held it out, it was a longer time ago. <laughs> so Tatsaikila meant just a few years ago. But as she said, ta and sometimes she would say, as long ago, 
of, of course, in the, in the Quileute language, as long ago as ten cedar trees can live, which are, or, you know, cedar trees can be very old. Uh, cedar trees in my area grow to be as old as 2,000 years and older. And there are still standing cedar trees that have that age, and they, they age them by looking at the annular rings that they, they, they uh, send in a uh, 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 thing that twists into the bark, and it pulls out a great big long core, and then they count the, the annular rings on that, and they can tell how old that tree is, or that stump, or whatever it is, or they're trying to age. And uh, these, these trees that, that exist there were, but that got that old were mainly the cedar trees. And uh, the cedar tree was very important to my people for building homes and canoes and, and the bark was used for various things, making clothing and basket weaving and, and uh, things to cook with. And uh, all kinds of different things came from the cedar tree. Uh, and there were other trees uh, as well. Uh, canoes and homes were probably the most important, longhouses, and uh, canoes of different sizes. They had uh, river canoes and ocean-going canoes. Sometimes those ocean-going canoes were as long as 50 feet, and uh, I'm a canoe builder myself. I, I've only built them up to 30 feet long, and I've repaired those that were up to 36 feet long, which were uh, actually known as whaling canoes, in my language, a bayet. And the seal hunting canoe is 26 feet long, uh, a lot cut, the river canoe, uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, avail. And uh, all of these, there, there were different kinds of avail. Some of them were small, some of them were long, but nevertheless, they, they had a, a use in the, in the river. And uh, I learned how to carve these canoes from, from the elders, and I still carve them today. But we, we have changed our ways of, of carving because of the environmental changes that have gone on where I'm from. The, the logging industry has taken almost every cedar tree that existed on the, on the west coast where I'm from, with the exception of those that are still growing in the uh, Olympic National Park and some in, some in the uh, 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 U.S. Forest Service lands. But uh, the ones that are still growing there, some of them, as I said, are pretty old, and they, they average uh, close to 1,000 years old right now. And uh, the, the, the succession of these trees have been going on for for uh, thousands and thousands of years, and uh, even during and after the ice age, some of the some of the uh, cedar trees still grew in some some certain areas where it wasn't uh, that cold. But you can always tell when a cedar tree was was uh, growing very slow because the annular rings were really really tight, especially in the uh, Alaskan yellow cedar tree. You had to look at that that uh, if you had a small section of a tree or a board from out of a uh, Alaskan yellow cedar tree, maybe a half an inch, you have to look at it through a, mic uh, a magnifying glass or a microscope and see how close those annular rings are. For instance, about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch, maybe, maybe a, a comprised of 100 to 200 years old, or 200 years of growth. That's how tight some of those were. And we built canoes out of uh, the cedar tree, mainly the, the female cedar tree. And it's because the female tree grew straight, and the annular rings were very tight. So it was a stronger tree than the male tree. And we could tell the difference between the two trees by looking at the seed pods. The male tree had seed pods that may have one or two or three little seeds inside of it. But the female tree usually had seed pods in it, uh, eight to 10 or, or maybe more seed pods in, in the seed, in the, in the pod. So we could recognize that as a, as a female tree. And sometimes you could just look at it, or if you were looking at a tree that had been down for a long time and was cutting on it, you'd just let, look at, this, look at the, uh, the annular rings. But uh, uh, cedar uh, was one of the things that was really important to us. I, I always said that this, uh, the uh, buffalo to the plains people was like the cedar tree is to the west coast to my people over here. And, uh, same way with the salmon. Uh, they depended largely on those two because they, they were in such great abundance in, in the uh, Pacific Northwest. And uh, I want to sit down now and I want to uh, maybe get into some uh, stories. Uh, how many... Uh, wow. 
hard to see you all with all this light here. But anyway, uh, how many of you are uh, are uh, uh, Twilight fans? Only three? Oh, there's more over here. Maybe half of you are more are uh, members of the Twilight group, but uh, I'm I'm thankful in many ways for the Twilight group and. Uh, in some ways for the book that was produced by Stephen Myers and uh, the only thing that I didn't care for it was she didn't get permission from the Quileute tribe where she got her information from on the website for the Quileute tribe and she saw the, the wolves and uh, began to take advantage of uh, the stories that were in there and, and because she wanted to uh, depict uh, the werewolf and of course none of my people are werewolves nor are they vampires. Uh, we don't suck blood, we, uh, we don't do that sort of thing, and uh, might look like it when we're kissing, but uh, <coughs> don't tell that to my wife, she's in here somewhere. Anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, the vampire and the uh, werewolf were never a part of, of my culture. Um, I want to tell you uh, how we became who we are and where we came from and how it got to be that way. There was one called Kwati. He was the, uh, a transformer or the changer. He was put on the face of the earth by the creator. And the creator gave orders to Kwati to do certain things to make uh, life on earth more pleasant for every living thing on the face of the earth, which included the crawling things that, that go through the through the ground and through the uh, woods, the floor, uh, or the uh, the uh, floor in the in the uh, uh, wooded areas, and uh, the animals from the very small to the very large, uh, all of these, according to my grandmother, have a living spirit or a spirit that that is within them, and so then we had to understand that and to respect all of these living organisms because they had a spirit like we do. And uh, uh, just for a little bit of trivia, my, whenever my grandmother got ill, she would ask me to go get a medicine man. And the medicine man would come to my, our home and he would sit down for a long period of time with my grandmother until it was time for him to go and to touch my grandmother's shoulders or somewhere to find out where the, uh, the sickness was, and uh, whenever a, the, the, the spirit or her soul was moved from her heart into another part of her body, say down her leg or on her arm or up on the top of her head, that meant she was ill, and it was up to the medicine man to find out where that illness was and to remove it, take it outside and, and, and throw it away and have it never come back and then the, the spirit that was uh, uh, dislocated would be put back where her heart is. And that, that was how, how the healing process was done for, uh, done through some of our medicine. That some of them were more powerful than the others and some of them had different means of doing it, but that was the main way that my, my grandmother got healing from the, uh, and she was a great believer in the great spirit. She was a very religious person. She prayed almost every day. She prayed a lot for my dad, and my dad was uh, everywhere. And he, he worked for Boeing, he worked for Todd Shipyard, he worked for the Navy, he'd done a lot of different things. But the, my, my father had a great knowledge of all the things that he learned from my grandmother and his, uh, his grandparents too. Uh, they, they gave him the name Mechmiach, or uh, his other name was Tawaladoch. In 1945, my grandmother gave me the name Dwasab. It was, uh, I was six years old, and uh, it was during the war, and when we lived at La Push, there, there, were no, there was no electricity. We didn't have lights. We, we had gas lanterns and, and uh, coal oil or kerosene, and we had candles, and, and during the war, there was a siren at La Push uh, that would sound it off, and when that siren sounded, that meant we had to snuff out all our lights because we, the, they sensed that there was some enemy in the, in either on the ocean or flying over. And, uh, of course, some of the enemies did come, come this far. And a lot of times we know, but we, never, we don't know that. 
And when I uh, hear about things that, that have happened to, to some kids, they were opening a, a, a package that they found in the woods and found out that it was a, a, a bomb that, that came from Japan by way of a, uh, a very small, uh, uh, what do they call these, air balloons? A very small air balloon, and they would put a bomb in it, and it floated in the air for several thousand miles. It would land somewhere, and it was just a way of terrorism. Well, somebody found one one time on the, in Oregon, and it exploded and, and injured a lot of people there. But that's just to give you an example of what, what, they were, what we still contend with today, even though the wars are over. Well, anyway, uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting sidetracked here a little bit. I hope you don't mind. Okay. That thank you from my heart. And I want to thank all of you. That, that means thank all of you from my heart. And uh, uh, there's other ways of saying thank you, but I'm going to do that at, at the end of, of uh, my talk. I, I want to tell you about the origin of my people. I'm wearing the shirt that depicts the wolf. And Kwati, uh, uh, the, the changer, started from down south in a place called Kuidaish. Uh, uh, and that's the, uh, the Kuyut name for uh, the place called Kunalt. And anybody ever heard of Kunalt? Very few of you. Kunalt is the... Uh, it's a reservation just south of my people, about 60 miles or 70 miles, as the crow flies. Well, Kwati <clears throat> uh, was uh, down there to visit his brother. And when he was down there, he, there was this big, beautiful lake. Huge, huge lake. And it was just like looking into a glass of water uh, that's sitting on your, your shelf or your table. It was so clear, you could see clear down to the bottom of that lake, it was so clear. But it was devoid of life. There was nothing living in that water. And Kwati said to himself, he said, well, this is a beautiful place for, to put some life. So he reached into the water with his hands, and he began to rub his hands like this. He pulled his hands out of the water, and he kept rubbing and rubbing and rubbing until he felt the little pellets of dead skin coming off on his hands from the, the dampness of it, and then he, he felt that there was enough uh, dead skin on his hands. He put his hands back in the water and swished them back and forth, and uh, the, uh, the dead skin, he, with a wave of his hand, the, the, the dead skin suddenly became to life and formed the uh, uh, sockeye salmon. And he summoned two sockeye salmon after he did that. He summoned two of them out, one male and one female. And he transformed those two salmon into the Quinault people, or Quidaich. And that's the origin of those people. And he saw to it that they had everything that they needed, including a great abundance of uh, sockeye salmon. So the lake that is there at Quidaich still produces a great abundance of sockeye salmon. And uh, when Kwati was moving further north, he came to a place called Chila. And Chala is the name of the whole river people. And a beautiful river, just full of uh, robust salmon. The spring salmon get to be 60 and 70 pounds in the shape of a football. Just really big, robust, bright, beautiful, tasty salmon. And it's been that way for a millennium. Uh, we don't know how many millennium. But that, nevertheless, those fish are still there because Kwati made it so. And... Uh, when these people were at Ho River, uh, the Ho River people were walking on their hands instead of their feet, kind of abnormal. And so they were dipping smelts with their dip nets in the, in the surf, in the ocean. And as they dipped their, their uh, dip net into the surf with their, with their feet, they would raise it up and Kwati said, this isn't right. So he, he uh, made them walk upright on their, on their feet. And he showed them how to hold the dip net and when you put the dip net into the water, the waves would wash the smelts in, and they would raise it up like that, maybe have uh, 5 to 20 pounds of smelt in one dip, and uh, very tasty fish. And they, they only get to be about 10 inches long, but uh, when you've got uh, thousands of them, they, there's a lot of food. 
And he made sure that the whole river people or the Chala had all kinds of smelt, and they still do today. They're the first ones along that coastline to get smelt every year. And uh, it's early in, in the year, and then a little bit later on, we, to the north, the, the Kuliut, uh, gets our, we get the smelt at least a month and a half or two months later. And uh, uh, the smelt were back when I was a child, there's millions and millions of them, tons and tons of them. My dad one time dipped 8,000 pounds, I think was, 8,000 pounds of smelt in one night. And they loaded them into boxes and shipped them off to the buyers where they were distributed around to various places who uh, bought smelt for food. Well, anyway, that's just to give you an idea of what happened to the smelt. They, they were just in great abundance. Now, with the advent of the logging industry, they have inundated some of the watershed and the, the siltation and, the, and all this have gone into the ocean and, and uh, uh, caused the demise of many different things because of the sedimentation that, that uh, came from the, uh, from the watershed. All kinds of different changes that, that occurred in the environment that uh, we don't like today because of, uh, we've had, every, every time the uh, environment changes, we have to change. To cope with it, and uh, so uh, this is one of the things. And I was talking to you a little bit earlier about building a canoe, and how, what the shortage is of the cedar tree. Well, a uh, long time ago, the cedar tree was very abundant, and now there's probably one tenth of one percent of the cedar trees left that are harvestable, and uh, we have to be careful about how we manage what's left because that's going to be all. Anyway, we have to change our way of producing a canoe. We no longer carve out a canoe to uh, make a single canoe out of a log. We take it to a sawmill and have it cut into strips and make strip-built canoes. And we put on a, a traditional bow and a traditional stern so it looks exactly like the canoes of yesteryear. And so uh, we have the wolf head on the, on the bow. We have the little protrusion that's on the bow. It's called a heart because uh, we wanted to have that canoe have a spirit, and so it was a living thing. And as it was growing as a tree, it was living. And so as a canoe, it's still alive with that heart carved into the bow and given a, a spiritual name that would help it to go out into the ocean and have it come back uh, safely to where it, it originated to bring the food back to their people. So canoes are important. Uh, when the uh, Kwati got through with all these uh, things that he was uh, making available to the whole river people. He moved a little bit further north to a place called Uzet, uh, Ozet today as it's named. And it was just a, a small village at one time and nobody lives there anymore, but there's a burial ground there and uh, there's a rock right offshore which is higher than this building is. And it's got a great big hole right in the middle of it. And that's what Toleak means, Toleak means hole in the wall. And so it, it, we, don't name pe we don't name places after people like the white man does. You know, he named Cook's Inlet and named all kinds of different places after famous captains of a long time ago who came from Europe. And uh, we decided that it was, it was good to name these places after what that place uh, produced or what it looked like or there's a there's a, a island right off of La Push called Muscle Rock because that there's mussels growing all around it on the on the uh, 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 high high part of the the tide the tide, the high tidal zone, and so that's where we one of the places that we get our, some of our mussels to to eat and uh, we just steam them just like you would steamers or clams very tasty. And uh, you can still get them in most places today, and they, they're, grown, they're grown usually in a different environment and man-made. But anyway, uh, Kwati saw that everything was, was uh, pretty much the same there. There were no people, but he moved to a place called Kwatleot, which is the name of my people. Kwatleot. We anglicized it, maybe, maybe I, don't, I shouldn't say we, but the people anglicized it to Quileute. So we are known as the Kuliut people. But in my language, I like to call it Kutleyot. It has a little glottal stop in there. Kutleyot. 
And uh, there was nobody there, no people, no human beings. But there are two great, big, beautiful wolves, timber wolves. They always travel in pairs, male and female. And he transformed these two wolves into the Quileute people. You see my shirt here. I depict that. I'm proud to wear this shirt because it means I'm, I'm respectable to who I am and where I'm from. Uh, my, my cousin made this shirt for me several years ago, and I'm even surprised that it still fits me. <coughs> You know, I was in the service uh, here back in 1958, 59, 60, and my, my uniform feels, I can't even begin to tell you how it fits. But anyway, I can't get it on. Uh, it happens. <laughs> I think everybody will one, one day find that it happens. Anyway, uh, when, he, when he was there at Quileo, uh he made some rules about the wolf that was there and the people that were there. He said, you can still have more than one wife. And the, the chiefs or the, the, uh, the, the leaders of the tribe could have more than one wife, just like the wolf did. He was the leader, he was the alpha, and the, the leader of the group, and so he was the chief. And it, it was that way so with the chief of a tribe that he was able to have more than one wife. But when they wrote the treaty in 1855, they put a clause in there saying you can only have one wife from now on. So the, the United States government saw to it that that was uh, so. Well, anyway, uh, Kwati saw to it that everything was, was uh, needed and, and uh, put there for the Kuliu tri tribal people for their needs, their wants, their desires, and uh, all the food they ever wanted, all the, the things they needed for making canoes and homes and baskets and, and uh, hunting implements, uh, uh, fishing implements, the tools, everything was there. The, the rocks, the, 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 the bones, the, uh, everything. And so the quality of life was just great. And they had everything they ever wanted. They, the, the berries, the, the, the little animals, uh, the deer, the elk, the bear, great abundances of everything, uh, the whale, the, the in the ocean on, on the shoreline, the crab and the clams and all those things that everybody likes to eat. I, I hope everybody likes to eat clams and crab. Not too many, I guess, that, that uh, don't like those things, but uh, they're, they're there for a purpose, and God put them there for a, for a real purpose, and we take advantage of it. And uh, uh, my people have many different things that we fish for in the ocean. We have halibut, we have crab, we have uh, black cod, we have bottom fish, we have a, an abundance of salmon, five different uh, species of salmon that, that come from my area, and the steelhead and all kinds of trout, uh, uh, just a, a myriad of different kinds of things that we uh, uh, go after for our livelihood. Well, Kwati saw to it that everything was, was uh, needed there at the, the, the Kuliut, and, uh, and don't forget that the, uh, the Kuliut were were very powerful people because they came from the wolf. And I'm proud to be a member of the Kuliut tribe. And uh, my heritage is there, and I depict it right here. And he, he walked a little bit further to a place called Ushet, or Ozet, as uh, some people call it today, in the books also, because it's hard to spell. And uh, at Ozet, there were no people, no human beings. But there were long-haired dogs that were all in the, in the area there, and uh, these long-haired dogs were kind of in a, in a small abundance, and he transformed a male and a female of the long-haired dogs into people. And so this is the origin of the Ozet people. The Ozet people don't, don't live there anymore, but there are no more Ozet people living on that reservation. The reservation doesn't have anybody living there. It's just a square piece of land that nobody occupies. And uh, uh, he saw to it that they had everything. There was a beautiful big lake there. He put uh, sockeye into that lake for, for their uh, use. And uh, uh, the ocean was uh, uh, full of uh, seals and sea lions and other mammals and fish of different kinds of shellfish and everything they ever needed for their quality of life. And he moved a little bit further to a place called Dayok. 
And we have no M's and N's in our language, in our alphabet. And deoct is like the, the N in, uh, in our alphabet, D. So it became nea to the white man. So we call it nea bay, and from, come, comes from the word deoct. And uh, the, the people that were, were there we had just come ashore from across to Canada. And they went through a storm, and their canoes were broken up. And uh, they were hungry. They had no food. They were wet. They were cold and just miserable. And when, Ka when Kwati got there, he waved his hands like this, and the canoes were suddenly repaired. And all the implements were there put back into the canoe, the paddles, the poles, the bailing apparatus, the mats for comfort, and uh, uh, all the things that they needed to, to make that canoe what it was, and the sails. And, and uh, the, uh, the Macaw people, as they are called today, uh, the, the Macaw tribe at Nia Bay, uh, have a great abundance of halibut. And that's what was, was uh, done by Kwati. He made sure that the, the Macaw people always had a great abundance of halibut. And so that, that is one of their uh, strong uh, points of, of their area where they are, is that the halibut are, are in great abundance. And the halibut spread out to as far as central Oregon, all the way up into Alaska. And those halibut will sometimes grow up to be 800 pounds. And that, that's a lot of meat, a lot of fish. The other day, we, they served halibut over here to some of our group that we were, we were hungry when they first came here from uh, our homes. And so they fed us, and, and I was surprised to find halibut on the menu. And there was also uh, buffalo. I had never mixed buffalo and halibut together. <laughs> but it was delicious. <clears throat> and I, I love buffalo burger. Whenever I, I go to Polson, Montana, I eat buffalo burger. When I go to Seattle, I eat sushi. <clears throat> well, sushi was part of my culture, too. My grandmother had a, uh, uh, a log that was anchored in the middle of the river at Dekato uh, Dak, at Dickey River. And uh, they, she had this little log anchored there, and then she would go up into the, into the bushes, cut off a salmonberry bush, clean off all the leaves, and then dangle it into the water with a little anchor. And we would go back one or two days later, and that, that little shrub would be full of herring eggs. It would just break off a stick. Mmm, <laughs> yum. Sushi, right there. And that was my, my introduction to sushi way back in 1943, 44. But it was, it was good, and our quality of life was great because we had everything we ever needed to eat. And uh, if we didn't eat it, we, we had to starve because our, our grandmothers and our grandfathers always said, eat or starve. So we ate. And uh, I'm healthy today. I'm 72 years old, and I'm still healthy. But I can do a 100-yard dash in 15 minutes flat. And by the time I get there, my knees hurt. But anyway, uh, the, all the quality of life was put on the coast for all these people. And this is the origin of all the people that were on the coast of Washington, from uh, Nia Bay all the way down to uh, Quinault. And uh, my people are right in the center uh, from either direction. And uh, uh, we have this uh, homeland, as we call it, uh, we at one time owned, were living on several pieces of land that we kept open by fire. Acres, hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of acres of land that we kept open by fire, and that was our homeland. Uh, the Forks Prairie, the, Qu the Quileut Prairie, and the Quileut Prairie had uh, uh, canvas. It's a little bulb, like a, 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 a daffodil bulb, and it was uh, one of our staple foods. And we wanted to make sure that when the government made their, the treaties with the tribe, that they would make sure that we had those available to us. And they're still there today. Anyway, uh, uh, that, that's the origin. I'm going to say that again. That's the origin of our people. And uh, uh, when uh, Stephanie Myers was writing her, her uh, beginnings of her writings, and she took advantage of that and, uh, and made millions and millions of dollars. And she's still making millions of dollars today 
off of uh, one little thing that she saw on the Kuyu website. And uh, it, it, it's good that we, we, uh, we were able to make somebody wealthy, but at the same time, she doesn't offer anything to us. But uh, nevertheless, we have everything we need. And uh, uh, I, I did give her a drum very similar to this one. It came from the last elk that I shot 12 years ago. And uh, she was very happy and glad to get that drum as a gift because of uh, her writings and uh, things that happened to my people after the advent of the first book, Twilight, and the people coming to the push to look for the people that were depicted in that book. They would write letters to uh, our tribal council and say, we want to come to La Push and meet these people that are in the book. <laughs> it's a novel. It is a fictitious book. And of course, when these people say that, we just have to laugh. And we welcome the people. So anybody that is a, a fan of Twilight, come to La Push sometime. You'll find there's a boundary line there. And it's the boundary line of the, uh, of the uh, 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 werewolves and the, what is it? Right. Anyway, there's a boundary line there that says, the, you're not to go beyond this because we, we don't want werewolves on our reservation. And uh, so that uh, all the people that come to our area, they look at that sign and everybody jumps out of the car with their cameras. And almost everywhere around that area, there's something having to do with Twilight. And all these fans has come from all over the world. And uh, we welcome them. So come to La Push sometime. And I, I want to say that you're very welcome there. And uh, you'll enjoy the, the ocean. You'll enjoy the, the different things that we, we have there. Uh, uh, we have a wonderful restaurant. We have uh, our, our school there. And, and uh, just a... Uh, a really beautiful place to be. And uh, I want to talk to you uh, again a little, maybe I'll, I'll get into a story that my grandmother, my favorite story. It's about two little girls that were taken captive by one called Tataquiel. They were out berry, berry picking with uh, their elders, the, the, the grandmothers and, and the, the aunts and the, and the other little children. They all went out to pick berries. And it was a ways from their, their village. And uh, the, there were two little girls that told them they, they wanted to go home because they were tired. And they had picked enough berries. And you could tell this by looking at their face. It was all purple and, and blue from the berries. And their hands were blue and purple from the berries. And so they, they had had their fill. And, and they, they did help to pick a few and put them in the bucket. But anyway, uh, they wanted to go home. And uh, the elders admonished the two little children. They said, go straight home. Don't go off the trail. Go straight home and hurry. Don't stop. And so after this admonishment, they, they agreed that they would go straight home. And uh, when the girls were on their way home, they saw this big, beautiful meadow. And the grass was standing nice and tall. It wasn't even wavering. With the, the, there was hardly any wind at all. And this grass was, it just looked so welcome. It said, Come on in here and lay down and rest and sleep. And so that's what the two little girls did. They went, and you could see where they walked. All the grass was pointing in one direction. And you could see where the girls had laid down. And uh, when, when the elders and, and all these people got home from berry picking, they couldn't find the two little girls. And everybody went out with torches and looked around all over. Uh, see if they could find the two little girls, but they, they gave up the search when their torches ran out. And so uh, they said, we'll, we'll come back in the morning. We'll continue our search again. And so it was the chiefs and the leaders that went out first because they knew what to look for, and they knew the land. They knew everything. And so they looked around, and they came up on this meadow, and they saw where the paths of two people had walked out, and they saw a place where the where the grass was laid down, where it looked like they, it ended there, and they laid down and went to sleep. And all the grass was still pointing in one direction. So this gave them the, the answer that those two children were still there. So they walked out in these two little paths, come to the end of it, and there was a, 
where somebody had laid down here and somebody had laid down here, and there was nobody there. But all the grass was still pointing in one direction, whereas if they had come out, the grass would have broken and would have been pointed the other way. It wasn't so. So uh, the leaders had uh, something in their mind that they, they knew that it must have been Tatakwil because he had done this sort of thing before. He liked to steal little children. And so when, when they, they made this uh, assumption that uh, uh, Tatakwil was the guilty one, then uh, they had to make a plan to go and rescue the two little girls taken by Tatakwil. And uh, one of the things to do was because Tatakwil lived in the sky, way, way up in the sky. He, and his home was like one of the stars that you could see. And uh, they, they gathered together to see what they could do and what, the best way to do it. And somebody come up with the idea of, of making a ladder out of trees, huge trees, the biggest trees that they could find. They went to the foothills and they cut down uh, several hundred uh, hemlock trees. They were tall, straight, no limbs for a long ways up. So that the, the only uh, limbs were at the very canopy of the tree itself. And so then they cut down these trees and they carved them into arrows. And they needed a bow. So they, they went higher up into the mountain where the Alaskan yellow cedar grows. And the Alaskan yellow cedar tree is a, a, a very tight grain, very resilient wood made a very strong bow and they made a huge bow out of this tree. And then the, when they gathered together to where they had the bow and the arrows, then they were looking for the place where uh, Tatakwil's home was. And the one that, that noticed where his home was, was the sharp-eyed slug, really sharp eyes. And uh, he looked up into the sky and he pointed up there with his uh, feeler and he said, right there, that's the tuck wheel's home, I can see it. And standing next to him was the jealous one because he thought he was the sharpest eyed, the hawk. So he tucked, he, he, he plucked the eyes out of poor little old slug, uh, Yachok, what else was his name. And the, uh, the, the, the hawk plucked his eyes out and said, I am the sharpest eyed one. I can see that far and now you can't see. So when you go out into the woods and you happen to come upon a slug going full speed down the trail with his feelers sticking out and see the two holes on the sides of his head, that's where its eyes used to be, no longer there. And so uh, as they were talking to one another, they, they said, uh, what we're going to do is make this uh, ladder out of all these uh, uh, arrows that were made out of a hemlock tree and shoot them end to end all the way down from, from where uh, Tatakwil's home was down to the ground. And then they could, they could ascend that uh, uh, tree uh, ladder all the way up to Tatakwil's home. Well, then the, the sharpshooters got together. And when they got together, they began to shoot. And the first arrow went up. And the second arrow went into the first arrow. The third arrow went into the second arrow. The fourth arrow went into the third arrow and saw all, all the way down to the ground where they were, made this ladder of uh, arrows stuck end to end all the way to the ground. And uh, then they decided, well, who's all going up this ladder? You gotta be brave. You gotta be strong. So all the strong ones and the brave ones, even uh, the robin, thought he was brave enough and strong enough, which he was. And uh, uh, Chocho, well, one of the things I'm forgetting is that they had to string this bow, this powerful bow. And the one to say, I, I am the strongest one here, was the killer whale. And uh, pa, or his, uh, I'll think of his name pretty soon. Anyway, uh, but he said, I can string this bow because I'm the biggest and I'm the strongest. So the killer whale grabbed that bow and he put one end into the ground and he was pulling up on the string to, to put the string into the notch and he couldn't do it. He just failed. And so uh, Akil, the bear, said, I'm the strongest. I, I'm stronger than you are. I know I am. In the meantime, in the background, there's a voice, small voice coming from Chocho. 
I can string the bow, let me try. I can string the bow, let me try. Cho-Cho is a little tiny bird, a wren. And he's just a little bit bigger than a uh, hummingbird. And they looked back there and they laughed at him. Who are you? Who do you think you are? He said, you, you're not strong enough to string that bow. He said, you can't even lift that bow. And they just laughed at him and, and uh, little Cho-Cho got back into his uh, little place behind everybody and said, I want to string that bow. And uh, uh, the elk, in all his splendor of his antlers, beautiful, strong-looking animal, I can string this bow. I'm the strongest one here. So he pulled, and he grunted, and he groaned, and he strained, and he could not string that bow. In the meantime, here's Chocho in the back saying, let me try, let me try. So finally, everybody conceded. OK, tough guy. He's only a little tiny thing. OK, you little runt. Come on, get up here, and let's see what you can do. And he actually did lift up the bow. It surprised everybody. And then uh, he took that bow. He stuck one end into the ground, pulled up on the string, notched it, twang. And uh, the string on that bow was so tight, uh, when he plucked it, it sounded like a, a beautiful music come up, <coughs> coming from a guitar string. Anyway, they, they had the bow strung. So now the sharpshooters were going to take their turn to uh, shoot and make the, the ladder. And they did so, as I said. The ladder came all the way to the ground. And then, then they decided who was going to ascend this ladder, uh, the big uh, uh, Akil and his son. The big bear and the little bear, they were going to go up the ladder. And then uh, 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 Ek, the bull elk, said, I am going up this ladder. And, and uh, the Adet, the beaver, said, I am going up this ladder. And of course, the leader was the eagle. He was wise and strong. He said, I'm going to lead you people. I'm going up too. So Pichtidach, uh, as he is called, and uh, the eagle got on the ladder and began to ascend, and all these began to follow him. And uh, there were several that were following him to the, to the home of Chautauquil. When they got to the top end of the ladder, it was so cold. They didn't realize that being up there in that heavenly body, that it was going to be that cold, almost like this morning outside. Maybe it was colder. And Pichtidach uh, uh, said, let's go out and find things to burn, and, and then bring them back here. And we'll, we'll build a fire right here, and we'll get warm. And then we can go to Tataquil's home. So everybody went out. All, all of them went out different directions and brought back things that they could burn to make a fire. And they looked at each other and said, we have no way of starting this fire. What are we going to do? And somebody looked across this body of water where they had missed their mark by a, a few miles from Tataquil's home. And there was this body of water toward his home. And uh, they looked across this body of water and they saw this column of smoke going up into the air. Great big column of white smoke. And they said, look over there. Tatakwil's got a fire in his home. He said, well, we can get some hot coals off his fire and bring it back here and start our own fire. And uh, Chidokoko said, I'll go, I'll go. So Chidokoko, the little robin, he took off flying over that body of water. And he flew all the way over to uh, Tatakwil's home. And he sneaked in the very stealthy like. And he heard this snoring noise because Tataquil loved to sleep. And they could hear him snoring. <laughs> and it gave him a sign that it was time for him to go in because he could hear him snoring. Well, Chidokoko went inside, but he never went back. Everybody was wondering. They said, Tataquil probably got Chidokoko and made him into a meal. And so uh, we need somebody else to go across to get some of those hot coals. So the Adit, the beaver, says, I can go there. I can swim in this cold water. So the beaver entered into the water and swam all the way across to Tataquil's home. And when he got to Tataquil's home, uh, he walked in very stealthily. He could hear Tataquil snoring again. 
But the funny part of it was there was two snorings going on. He goes, <laughs> and the other one was, was a slight, slightly lighter snore. And uh, Beaver, the object, looked over at the fireplace where the fire was, where there, all the hot coals were, and who should be standing up there next to that fire, sound asleep and comfortable, getting warm from the fire, was Chidokoko, the robin. He's a, he was up against that fire for so long, his breast turned red. <laughs> and so, and uh, he woke him up and said, we need to get some of these hot coals and bring them back to our friends across over here and build a fire so they can get warm. And then we'll come back all together and rescue the two little girls that were taken captive by Tatakwil. So uh, they loaded all the hot coals that they could put on the Adet's tail. And the Adet swam all the way across, just barely holding his tail out of the water. And of course, Chidoko flew over, and they all went back to their uh, friends, and, and they built this fire out of the hot coals. And uh, one thing that happened to uh, De Ade, they looked at De Ade, and his tail was burnt. No more fur. It was black and wrinkled, where he had a lot of fur. And today, Beaver still has no fur on his tail. It's still black, and it's wrinkled. That was because he carried those hot coals back and was the hero that made the fire. Well, anyway, after uh, they made the fire and they decided who was all going, everybody was going across this body of water. And uh, they decided how they were going to do it. And they made this plan. They agreed what their plan was going to be. And they began to go across. And one called Pakwad, a scape fish, he had to swim. And it was deep. And he went down, down, down into the depths of this water. And all the other beings were going across. And it was uh, like, here's Tatakwil's home. Here's the group, straight line, shorter than the distance that Pakwad had to go underwater. So they got out, they, they, all that group got over there first. And here come Pakwad. He was trying to catch, everybody, catch up to everybody, but he was, he was going and swimming as fast as he could. Pakwad, the scape fish, uh, I don't know if you know what a scape fish looked like. They're huge, and they're flat, just like a kite. And they live on the bottom of the ocean, and uh, just like a halibut. But anyway, he come out of that water just as fast as he could, and he flew for a ways because he glided and landed right there with a resounding kerplop right on Tatakwil's front door. Woke Tatakwil up. And Tatakwil come lumbering out. Who's there? Taka ho ho, taka ho ho, who is over there? Uh, and little old, uh, uh, who was it? Beaver said, it is me, the odd beaver. And, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting mixed up here. I'm, I'm <laughs> happens when you get this age. Anyway, uh, uh, I'm trying to repeat myself, and I don't want to do that. Uh, Tatakwil was uh, woken up by this resounding kerplop from, uh, from Skatefish, and he went to the doorway, and he looked around, and he looked around. He said, I must be dreaming. I must have dreamed this. I, didn't, I don't see anybody. I don't see anything here. So uh, uh, Pakwad was there laying on the ground in front of him, and the reason he couldn't see him was because Pakwad, or skatefish, has the ability to camouflage himself and make his color the same color as all the background where, he, where he's laying on the bottom of the ocean. And here he was on, on, next to him on his, on his uh, ground next to his home, and he turned into the color of the same surroundings there, so Tatakwil couldn't see him. And uh, he, he agreed to himself that there was nobody there and is uh, going to go back and go to sleep. But before he could do that, he said, hmm, I got to urinate. Poor old 
Pocklot. He got it pretty bad. <laughs> and uh, if you ever happen to eat skate fish and wonder where that weird flavor comes from, <laughs> well, that, that's it. See, whether you believe it or not, uh, skate fish is still eaten today. And it is, it is uh, it, they don't call it skate fish, they, they call it something else. And it's, they, they take like a cookie cutter and they'll go around and cut out little round pieces of the flesh of uh, pockwad or skate fish. And it is sold for, uh, uh, oh, what is that little round? Anyway, uh, that, that's the food stuff, that, that uh, it's fake stuff, and, it, and uh, it has a weird flavor. Anyway, uh, everybody agreed that after uh, Tatakwa all went back to bed, they could hear him snoring again. So this was their cue that they were going to go into Tatakwa's home and look for the two little girls that were probably bound and gagged. So they went into the home of Tatakwil very stealthily. And when they walked into the home, they could hear Tatakwil snoring again. And that was their cue that they could look all over in his house and be quiet while they were looking for the two little girls. They found the two little girls that were bound and gagged and they took the ropes off and ungagged them and said, we're, we've come to rescue you, you're going home. Come, we thank you for, for uh, being quiet and being good so that you didn't make noise to, to, uh, to talk well that he would come out while we were making noise. We won't make any more noise. So uh, they unbound the little girls and said, we're going home. So everybody met out in the front of uh, Tatakwil's home like they had planned, and uh, except one, he was very slow. That was Yachokwadas, uh, uh, the slug. He was in the back of the house still looking around, and when uh, everybody was going to go to the back to the ladder, then he saw that he had to catch up to them. So he began to speed up a little bit, and then he ran into a pile of, of uh, firewood. And he knocked down this pile of firewood, and they made all kinds of rumbling and racket noise. And, and this woke Tataquil up again. Tataquil got up to see what was going on. And he could see all these going toward the ladder, and he didn't know what was going on for sure. But they had the two little girls with them, and they were rescued, and they were going to go home. And they all got to the ladder every one of them, and they began to descend on the ladder, and they didn't get very far when Tataquil jumped on the ladder, and he was so big and so heavy, the ladder fell apart and broke. And so when we look up into the sky, we see the heavenly bodies. We see the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, the Big Bear and the Little Bear. Over in some other area, we see Cassiopeia and the Rocking Chair, and over here we might see Taurus the Bull, and over here, Pacwa, the escape fish that's shaped like a kite. Uh, all these constellations that were created as a result of Tataquil breaking the ladder. And so that, that's my story of how our constellations got to be. But one of the things that happened after that was a strange thing. Tataquil, or being so big and heavy, he fell all the way to earth. He landed in a place called Ozet, and it was a swampy area, really soft ground. When he landed there, he made a big, huge indentation in the ground because the ground was so soft, and he got up and shook himself off, and this great, big, huge indentation, water began to flow into it. So that became Ozet Lake, and it's still there today. But uh, the other part is that uh, Tataquil made this him, his new homeland, and he uh, met a mate, another Tataquil, and there they lived and raised many, many, many children, and they spread out to other parts of the country. And we still have them here today. They're all over, but they're very, very stealthy, very quiet. We don't see them very much or hear about them very much. 
and uh, you're lucky to see one. We call them Sasquatch. <laughs> but uh, there's so many skeptical people. I have seen Sasquatch myself, honestly, and I hunt for Sasquatch to prove to the world that he exists. There are other people around the world that go out looking for Sasquatch because they, they know that he exists, they've heard him, they have seen some of the signs that he leaves behind and some of the, some of the, the signs that he makes with, uh, if you go to a farmland and they have cattle there, all these cattle will all of a sudden huddle together because they fear Sasquatch, they can sense when he's there and you can hear the dogs barking or, or some other noises coming from some other area which give us the signs that Sasquatch is there. So we know when he's in the area and it's usually in springtime when he comes down from the high hills and the uh, uh, vegetation begins to sprout new uh, abundances of all different kinds of buds that come from the, from the uh, shrubs and that the, he's, he's largely vegetarian, believe it or not. But he does eat meat. He loves fish, he loves clams, he loves to eat uh, different smaller animals like the raccoon, and uh, he's a very good hunter, very stealthily. And the thing about Sasquatch is that he can make any noise. He can mimic anything that's out there in those woods. He can mimic the, the sound of the deer or the frog or the tree frog. And so, it, it may give you the idea that there's something else there other than Sasquatch. So uh, some of you skeptics, if you have, ever happen to go out into the woods and hear some strange noises out there, uh, it could be. You never know. Um, I'm going to stop there, and I want to ask for any questions. Anybody got any questions out there? Please I'll be happy to, to answer. Please raise Anything. your hand if you have any questions. A big pardon? I don't have it. No questions? Yes. I beg your pardon? The two girls. Did they become a constellation? The two girls. <laughs> yes. I, you know, the one of them was Cassiopeia. And I, I'm not, I, you know, when they were telling me the story that they, they just talked about Cassiopeia. And uh, that, that's, uh, they're, they're probably more, uh, if you look at some of the, uh, history of some of the areas like I was talking to a young lady from China yesterday and she said they have a, a very similar story and you go to Europe and you'll find that they have a very similar story and uh, it, it never ceases to amaze me it's that some of these stories are like like the great flood that's depicted with uh, Noah in the Bible uh, we had a great flood here also and uh, there's a story about that, and uh, it, it's a long story, but uh, if we'll come back here next year, maybe we'll go through it. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we need to wrap it up here, so if you could please join me in thanking Chris Morgenbach from the Philly Culture of Western Washington. Thank you all for coming, and enjoy your visit to the museum. As you uh, depart, I want to sing you a song of the Great Wolf. And the song is about the wolf howling to the people and the people talking back to him. Go Good traveling to you. Thank you from my heart. I'll think of it tomorrow. Uh, it's, uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm so proud to be here and glad to have a group 
that is, are good listeners, and I hope you understand who we are now. We're not werewolves. We are the wolf. And thank you very much. Watch all these stuff.